Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have no intention at all of reading this 11-page statement. It's been circulated, so I'll pick the eyes and try and give it my edition of it. Um, for those of you who do not know what uh, PIDF stands for, it's Pacific Devel Island Development Forum. It was established initially in 2013, regularized in 2015, and it is an attempt in the Pacific to engage not only governments, but everybody who are in, in, the, chain, in, the, in the chain of development, starting from the village to the communities, to the provinces, NGOs and private sector organization. When you see the way they are organized and the activities they undertake, it is the first attempt in that part of the world to try and really capture everybody talking together and talking about development cooperation that is meaningful to them. The idea is that they should drive the agenda about their own development. And this is one of the reasons why when you see PIDF, it is critical main functions are Piango, which is the Pacific, regional Pacific uh, organization, umbrella organization for NGOs. And then you have uh, PIPSO, which is the private sector organization, uh, umbrella organization in the Pacific, and they engage the private sector. And then that's how they do their work. Uh, principally, those are some of the major, major, you know, if you like, the various uh, bodies that exist in the PIDF umbrella, and that, that carries its uh, uh, work program forward. It uh, also claims to run a very small secretariat, therefore cost effective. And uh, I think there was this, currently there's only about 15 technical staff, and a lot of them are project funded. Uh, they have started to, to do some very interesting work, and I think the ones that I will highlight in this uh, uh, interesting presentation that I'm making on using uh, Mr. Mara's notes is to refer principally to climate change issue and the challenges. And what are some of the community-based projects that they have engaged in with Pacific Island countries? The, uh, the, their methodology in getting to do what is what they call the Talano sessions. They talk a lot. These, these people spend a lot of time talking to each other. They're very good in talking. And uh, at all levels of the communities, and they bring them in. They have uh, specially developed, uh, they also uh, engage a lot of expertise that are normally left outside the normal policy framework development for those of us who've been in government process for long. They, take, they spend a lot of time talking to people about spiritual issues and other social dynamics which are often not so much uh, mainstreamed into the thing of policy development in that part of the world. It's now creeping in through the role that I'm playing by the Pacific Council of Churches, which is one of the major uh, um, participants in the, in, in, the, uh, in the sustainable consultation that makes PIDF. Now, I, 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 at page five of the paper, they, they, he talks about how they aim to make a win-win solution. They're not very much uh, like me, uh, antagonistic in his approach, or because of my, they try and engage as many people uh, as widely as possible to try and solve the problems that are being identified by the community people themselves. They make reference to two examples, and I'll read this part. In one of our efforts, we aim to support our islands, towns, and cities to become green islands, green towns, green cities. It is, of course, a gradual process. One such island is the island of Banga in Fiji, which is, has nine villages. Its council has been engaged with civil society organizations for many years to become greener. Ocean waters hitting the coral reef of Banga is facing a problem from, this, from the destructive species of the crown thorn of fish, which preys on coral and seaweed with clogs and suffocate the reef. What they've done is out of this problem, to solve their problem about reef devastation is that they've used the crown, crown of thorn uh, uh, starfish. Eh? They use it to actually make a fertilizer, which is very good for those who are trying to produce organic products as a way of developing solutions. And, and this is now apparently working very well and becoming an income uh, an additional income stream for the people on the island. Another, another initiative is currently running with funding from Korea uh, is to build capacity 
uh, in the with, sorry with the government of India through the UN uh, India UN Development Partnership Fund is the setting up of solar funding for most residents in village smart village solar grid projects and this is of course the primary dri driver for this is SMEs targeting especially youth and women in the various communities in the Pacific. The initial uh, project funding for this came from uh, from the Indian government through the uh, framework that is now touted by the United Nations on South-South Trilateral Cooperation. And it seems to be working very well in the, in the Marshalls, in two other countries in which this has been t tested, and also in Fiji. The, this is uh, to them as an example to show how village and community and engaged groups can directly suggest ways in which to solve the problem that they are facing instead of everything being ringed through the, the government structures and being held up unnecessarily uh, in trying to find the solutions to their problem. Clearly, they, they, is, they also try to address uh, the, some of the issues of uh, specific issues relating to climate security, which are more personal and related to the dislocation that arise from communities. In Fiji alone, we've had this terrible experience of relocating villages. I had personally asked to attend one. I was sitting there for about half a day listening to people complaining why they shouldn't move. And I said, what? We're going to build you better houses. Why aren't you moving? It just shows that I had to bring in a totally different framework if this is going to succeed. But it is very important to see now how the new discussion in this area is beginning to change a lot. People's life are being, even though they're supposed to be relocated to higher ground, it doesn't necessarily mean that they feel better. And the challenges of how do we mainstream some of the main UN instruments that govern this process is, is now going to be another area of focus. Climate change is in action is really the biggest complaint that PIF is vocalizing now. There's a lot of many discussions taking place both in the UNCCC uh, bodies and others that are associated with that kind of discussion. But Pacific Island communities and countries are complaining that the solution, the time it takes, and the lack of funding is not going to be around uh, for many, in some cases it just takes far too long to find enough to be able to make uh, their position to change, eh? to change their position to be a better one. So it, it, it's very important for us to try and understand that the, the challenges that are now currently being faced uh, needs to be discussed in action-oriented issues. One of the, clearly, when I look at these things, some of the things that come to mind is how do we try and find another form of funding some of the projects that are so critical to the sustainability of these communities, other than the standard ADB, you know, that kind of thing. Because when study going that pathway, it becomes a 10-year process automatically. And if there is a better and more uh, easier way uh, to do it and understanding the peculiarities of civic island countries, then that might be the solution. The asymmetrical security issues that are being thrown out by climate change uh, is not yet fully doc documented, but when it will be fully documented, it will be challenging some of the standard procedures and uh, wherewithal we, in which we are reacting to solutions today. So this is some of the things we need to be uh, careful at PIDF in a very small way is beginning to look into this space. Okay. The other thing that I want to do, and which I said in my speech, and I said now before I sit down again, it is now a human rights issue, even though by definition it's not a refugee issue. When the uh, guy from the Republic of Kiribati took his case to the United U UN Human Rights Committee to claim that his right to life is being impacted by inundation of water, seawater into his livelihood in the Kiribati, everybody laughed. But the UN Committee has ruled that Yes, he has a right to life in that context, except that he didn't establish the case for it. From a lawyer's point of view, that's a pretty good opening for me if I was defending cases like that. Okay, so the future, the, the landscape for discussion is getting wider, and it's going to be interacted, but from the PIDF position, is they are trying to engage as many people, and the, the quicker we can let them to engage freely, even at international level, so the NGOs in Japan and others can actually go to Fiji or other parts of the Pacific and engage directly in the solution that we are talking about, there might be a better way. And that requires a different framework, which currently is not reflected in the Palm framework. It's still government to government. We need to move much faster to address some of those issues. 
ladies and gentlemen, that's the, the eyes I've picked up from this uh, long document and highlighted the ones that you might want to comment. And I thank you again for giving me your attention. Naka. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Kensara. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Nanise Sounding Galo Ewai, and I work with the UNDP Pacific Office uh, based in Suva, Fiji. Um, I would like to take this time to thank the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for the invitation to speak. Um, generally, I've been asked to give a bit of an overview of UNDP's work uh, in the governance space in the region. Uh, therefore, that's what I will be covering today, uh, a bit of what we do uh, as the UNDP Pacific Office uh, in, the, in the region. Um, I thought to start off with by giving an overview um, before I talk about UNDP and the governance work, I thought to start off with by giving an overview of what UNDP in the region does. So this slide will go into setting a bit of the context of UNDP in the Pacific. Uh, the UNDP Pacific Office, uh, we are part of the 170 country office network globally. Um, the UNDP Pacific Office uh, is a result of a merger of two offices. Um, the regional program, which was by, done by UNDP Pacific Center, and the country office, which was done by the Fiji multi-country office. The Pacific sub-regional program document 2018 to 2022 uh, basically is the legal instrument and provides the framework to UNDP's pro programmatic work in the 14 Pacific Island countries that we work in. Through our regional program, we're able to cover 15 Pacific Island countries, and our country program, we're able to cover 10 Pacific Island countries. In terms of the way we develop, uh, deliver development assistance, uh, we're able to do so uh, at three tier or three levels. That is, we're able to deliver programming at a regional level, which covers 15 uh, Pacific Island countries, at a multi-country level where we focus on very specific countries, and bilaterally at a country level where we have direct uh, uh, bilateral assistance to the country. Uh, in terms of our physical presence in the Pacific Island countries, uh, UNDP has four uh, com uh, uh, UNDP offices based in Fiji, PNG, Solomon Islands, and Samoa. In addition to those, we have what we call joint presence initiatives where we uh, uh, host offices with other UN agencies and we host JPO offices in uh, another six countries within the Pacific. We have a number of donors that actually contributes to uh, UNDP's program and the, the diversity of the donors very much confirms the confidence of the national governments as well as the international and local communities um, in our role as the, as the partner of choice. The UNDP Pacific Office, uh, we deliver uh, annually between, um, for the last three years since 2016, between 30 to 50 million uh, of development assistance annually and we are continuing to grow as an office. Uh, the UNDP, uh, we're one of the many UN agencies that are and programs and funds that are based in Fiji. We do carry out a number of uh, programs in partnership with other UN agencies, but we also host on behalf of the UN system a number of specialized functions and agencies within UNDP. The next slide basically provides um, a bit of a background, an overview of why we do the work that we do. Uh, so basically, UNDP globally, we work to support their uh, countries in their efforts to address uh, numerous diverse development uh, challenges, which in, in UNDP, we generally frame them around three development settings, uh, obviously requiring different forms of support. And the three development settings are as outlined out in the presentations, eradicating poverty in its all of its form, structural transformation, and building resilience to crisis and shocks. Uh, it's quite often this, that these three development challenges often coexist within the same country and uh, therefore will require uh, tailored solutions that will address uh, this specific deficit as well as the barrier. However, underpinning these uh, three development challenges uh, is very much a set of core development needs, uh, uh, including the need to strengthen gender equality, the empowerment of women, and ensuring the protection of human rights. 
Uh, so uh, the three development settings that I've outlined um, just now, what UNDP is doing is then it's implementing uh, six cross-cutting approaches to development, which is known uh, within UNDP and also generally as our six signature solution. Basically, they're a way in which UNDP has been able to put together uh, our, our best signature skill set or our best work into the way in which we can achieve some of these development challenges and at the same time assist countries to, us, to achieve their sustainable development goals. We, we do recognize that not one of these uh, solutions will succeed on its own. Uh, we need all of the six solutions to work together in order to, to achieve uh, the st sustainable development goals. Uh, you, the, the signature solutions are meant to be cross-cutting approaches to, to development because they're very much inter, interrelated, the six uh, solutions. Uh, UNDP is therefore able to tailor this unique combination to meet each of the country's needs. So the six signature solution that I was talking about is now referred to in the, this slide. So this slide gives an overview of what the six signature solutions are. And the, uh, there are three of these six signature solutions that apply to the governance work that UNDP does in general, and uh, obviously to UNDP and our work here in the Pacific. Uh, the, sig uh, the signature solution related to governance, the signature solution related to zero resilience, and the signature uh, solution related to gender are very much the three that are relevant to the governance work here in the Pacific. So the next slide provides a bit of an, uh, a rationale to why we are doing the governance work that we're doing in the Pacific. Uh, so this slide uh, uh, outlines a bit some of the governance challenges here in the Pacific. Uh, again, uh, for those that work in the Pacific, you'll know that all countries very much elect their governments through democratic elections. Uh, however, the decision making is still influenced by some formal and also traditional governance system. Uh, there's a reliance on chiefly system and religion structures that remain quite widespread here in the Pacific. Uh, despite some of the recent successes that have been manifested by, by credible election, the, the region still faces some challenges, uh, including political stability, its impact on peace and development. There's also been an in, increase in the influence of finance uh, on politics and, ele and election. Some of the other uh, challenges, governance challenges that actually uh, impact on the development of the Pacific also include uh, the weak political institutions that are unable to fully discharge their mandate, and in some cases they are weak or even non-existent uh, local governance structure. There is also uh, poor delivery of government services outside the urban areas, uh, limited connectivity uh, that, that uh, affects the delivery of more inclusive forms of development. Uh, nearly half of the Pacific populations are not yet users of the mobile phone services, uh, with Kiribati and Tuvalu having the lowest mobile subscription. Um, on the other rate, uh, on the other hand, the subscribers rate grew at an annual compound rate of let's say 26% to um, in 2018, 19, with more Pacific island uh, islanders accessing the internet and social media uh, through their mobile uh, devices. While the democratic environment is actually changing, uh, there's a rise uh, with the rise of social media, the increase in urbanization, uh, the regional and global economic integration. Uh, however, those that remaining furthest behind or are not included in the development are often the youth, the women, and those that are more geographically isolated uh, in remote areas. And it's often women and youth that have that play very much a limited role. Uh, in decision making and therefore uh, very much uh, at risk of being further marginalized. Uh, weak governance structure very much give rise to disputes over land and other matters. Uh, while some countries uh, have made progress towards uh, gender equality with the empowerment of women through either legal or policy reform, uh, gender discrimination, uh, gender exclusion and gender-based violence remains a serious concern here in the Pacific. Uh, women only comprise eight 0.2% of national legislator if you exclude Australia and New Zealand, therefore making it the lowest uh, number of women member of parliament uh, globally. Uh, so youth unemployment in the subregion is very much limited as well. So it's against this backdrop, um, while this is not an exhaustive list, it is against this backdrop that UNDP has framed its governance work in the region. 
So the next slide uh, basically provides an overview of the governance work that the UNDP Pacific Office um, undertakes within the region. Uh, on annually, we, uh, the, the uh, UNDP Pacific Office delivers between 14 to 17 million US dollars per annum in terms of development assistance in the governance area uh, across the Pacific. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, in terms of the way we develop the, uh, the way we deliver the development assistance, we do it on three tier. Uh, we do it on a regional level, right across 15 Pacific Island countries. We do multi-country where there's very specific focus on only specific countries, and obviously uh, at the country level as well. In total, we have about 22 projects and program in which the bulk of our delivery in terms of financial delivery is at the country level programming. In terms of our key engagement areas in the way we work and deliver our governance programming, the first area of work that we do is around the work that we do around um, uh, uh, fighting corruption with our anti-corruption work in which we undertake this work with our partner from uh, uh, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. The second area of our work is what we call within UNDP inclusive political processes. So those include all our work that we do around constitution reform, work we do with political parties, work we do with women in politics, work we do to support electoral management bodies, and work we do to support uh, the strengthening and development of, of parliaments. Uh, the, the third area of our work is called rule of law uh, and access to, to justice. The focus of our work in this area is really around institution building, and we work with the judiciary, we work with national human rights institutions, we work with the police, we work with the legal aid commissions. And the fourth area of our work is what we call public financial management, where we work on downstream PFM, where we work in terms of following the money, mostly with the Auditor Generals and the Public Accounts Committee to be able to, um, uh, it's around from, uh, integrity and promoting transparency around, around the use of public finances. Uh, the fifth area of our work is around development minerals. Uh, again, this is a growing uh, sector uh, in the Pacific. And it's also one of the sectors that is highly unregulated. So we work with uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, a number of countries to be able to develop the governance uh, of of these uh, of this particular sector. The sixth area of our work is around conflict prevention and peace building. Uh, this work is mostly concentrated in um, in Solomon Islands and in uh, Bougainville. Again, the, the seventh area of our work is around local governance. It's, uh, it's around strengthening and building the, strength, uh, the institution of the subnational structures uh, and, and provincial governments to be able to, to deliver uh, on its mandate uh, to deliver services to, the, uh, to its provinces and municipality. Again, the last area of our work is around health and development, and this is mostly around ensuring access to basic health services uh, uh, in relation to HIV and AIDS, TB, and malaria. Uh, Cross-cutting work that we're doing is around civic education and gender equality, so uh, civic engagement and gender equality. So civic engagement is mostly working with the civil society um, uh, organizations to be able to strengthen the demand side of accountability across the, area, the eight areas that we work. And obviously gender equality as a principle, but also as a, as a programming approach is very much integrated right across the work that we do along the eight uh, areas that I've just highlighted. So the next slide basically just talks, uh, just uh, provides an overview and, and a highlight of some of the, our key achievements in the last uh, three years. Uh, in the last three years, uh, the governance uh, aspect of UNDP's work has been able to deliver over 50 million in development assistance across the Pacific Island um, uh, countries to strengthen public institution, um, help fight corruption, but also support inclusive political uh, participation. We've been able to support over 200 members of parliament and over 150 uh, staff to, to capacitate them in their role uh, in terms of effectively undertaking their role of oversight, uh, legislative role, and representative role. Uh, we've been able to support over six Pacific Island countries and their parliaments to increase the financial accountability of the executive or the government. Uh, through the production of independent budget analysis of their respective national budget when they are tabled. We've, able to been, uh, we've been able to support four Pacific Island countries to establish anti-corruption policies and one country to establish the Independent Commission Against Corruption. We've been able to facilitate a number of um, the holding of credible elections in two Pacific Island countries. 
Uh, we've been able to support uh, the ongoing political reform efforts in one particular country. We've been able to facilitate a number of regional dialogues and discussion on very political uh, sensitive issues that are quite difficult to uh, progress the discussion nationally. We've been able to do it on a regional level. We've undertaken a number of uh, capacity building of political institutions to enable them to effectively discharge of their mandate. Uh, our support, UNDP support, has also been very much instrumental in the integration of gender issues, particularly in political institution processes and practices. We've been able to also connect over 50,000 Pacific Island citizens in the most report, remote parts of the countries with their respective governments in four, uh, in four Pacific Island states in order to enable them to access basic services and also have access to justice. We've also been able to improve um, health care and treatment for people affected by HIV and AIDS and TB in 11 other countries. Uh, so I've also been asked to talk a bit about some of the challenges that we face in terms of doing the work that we do. Uh, firstly, governance uh, is quite a sensitive area of engagement uh, and it's not uh, an easy place and, in, and an easy space to work in and it's also not an easy place for, for donors or de um, uh, development partners in, in particular to get returns on their investments and it's also um, in, in most cases is seen as a risky area of engagement for, for donors. Uh, another area of uh, a challenge is this issue of sustainability. Uh, and there's a number of factors that actually influences uh, the sustainability of any intervention. Obviously, political will and buy-in is very important. Uh, there's also, it's very important that there is national ownership for any particular intervention. Uh, one of the things that we've also found is one of the challenges is the, that there's at times a lack of an exit strategy and an inadequate monitoring uh, that impedes or affects the way and the ability to deliver a program successfully. So, um, and then second last is, um, again, the diversity of the sources of funding uh, within UNDP and within the UN system, uh, we are uh, facing an increasing challenge of declining in our core funding, uh, which has then, um, um, which has then encouraged UNDP, but also uh, to look outside uh, in terms of uh, securing the resources it needs in order to deliver on the programming. Therefore, as an office, we're continuously looking for partnership with, uh, with private uh, sectors, uh, with other development partners, and with foundations to be able to continue some of the good work that we're doing. The other challenge that we have to programming is, again, uh, the absorption capacity of your, of your national counterparts, not only looking at the financial capacity, but also the technical capacity to be able to, to receive the, the development assistance that, uh, that's currently on offer. So this is my last slide, just in terms of the way forward and where we're thinking of going um, as UNDP uh, and again as the governance program, uh, we're always looking for opportunities to be able to do more, that is scaling up of our existing programs and also new programs to continue to do some of the work that we're doing within the eight areas that I've already highlighted. But also one of the things that we're now beginning to think through is this issue of climate change, as it's quite an um, a very uh, important issue here in the Pacific and one where that is severely affecting the region. And we're looking at the how the issue of climate change and its implication on governance in the Pacific. So we're still thinking through what what this might look like and what the challenge might, uh, might be. Uh, so there's still a bit of research uh, that we're looking to undertake in this area to be able to define specifically what the challenges are, but what our programming uh, and assistance might look like in this specific area. Of work. Madam Director, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Before I start my presentation, I believe that a small clarification is in order. I do not represent the Republic of Malta, the beautiful island state in the Mediterranean Sea which is also a, a European Union member state, but the Sovereign Order of Malta, which is a sovereign entity with international public law personality, whose government is based in Rome, that is at the United Nations as a permanent observer and has diplomatic relations with 109 countries. The order has been sovereign since the 12th century and its mission is delivering humanitarian aid to the sick and the poor. Thank you. So, the title of my lecture 
is the dynamics and interrelation between climate change and regional security. And since I am a believer in conceptual clarity, I would like to venture into defining and identifying the scope of some concepts that are included in the title of my lecture. First of all, security. We, heard, we hear about security all the time. But our understanding of what constitutes a security issue has moved well beyond the use, threat, and control of military force. In other words, we shouldn't conflate security studies with strategic studies. Now, the scope of security has broadened significantly over the last decades. And for the sake of simplicity, we may say that whenever there is an existential threat to a reference object to a state, but also to a community, uh, and such existential threat is so serious that justifies the use of extraordinary measures to handle it, then we are in the realm of security. Security has become a multidimensional and multilayered concept and idea. So now the concept uh, grouped together traditional geostrategic calculations. One example, we are in Japan, North Korea, and the denuclearization of Northeast Asia, and new security, non-traditional, and new security challenges. A very topical example, the coronavirus issue that we are experiencing in these days. So that's a graphic representation of how security has become multidimensional. Traditional threats, then we have terrorism, then we have social environmental vulnerabilities, and so on. Okay. Then the title also includes the word region. And when it comes to the Pacific Islands region, geography and political geography can help only to a certain extent. Uh, does the region overlap with the confines with the, of the, the geographic scope of Oceania? Well, it's debatable. Then should we adopt or conventionally regard the region as the one that is included in the, the scope, geographic scope of the Pacific Island Forum? But there's also, there are also other regional organizations, like the Pacific Island Development Forum. And as you can see, Australia and New Zealand are part of the region in the first case. In the second case, they are not. So uh, maybe we can ask for uh, the help of uh, international relations studies. And uh, there's a very useful concept that of uh, the regional security complex that can help us to uh, draw the borders of the region when it comes to security and climate change. So a, a regional security complex is defined uh, as a group of states whose primary security concerns make are such that make their national security interdependent. So within the regional security complex, within this cluster, within this reg regional cluster, security ind independence is more intense among the actors than without. Then, how does an issue becomes a security issue. There's a process, a process of securitization. And if we 
adopt the theoretical outlook of the Copenhagen School of Security Studies, of the most famous scholar there is, uh, Barry Bozam, uh, security can be defined as a speech act. Uh, in other words, by talking security, we move away one issue from the area of politics and we draw it into the security realm that and by doing and within the security realms extraordinary measures and means against the threat are justified the threat is socially constructed in the sense that the process of securitization is intersubjective it means that it is neither a question of an objective threat or of subjective perception, but uh, securitization depends on the audience accepting the securitization speech act. This is a representation of the process. There is an existential threat that is uh, posed to a referent object, normally the state, but not only state actors. And uh, thanks to a speech act, that issue is securitized, and then extraordinary measures are planned and taken. Well, in the case of the Pacific Islands region, if we want, if we wish to pinpoint in time the speech act, I believe that we can take the 2018 Boy Declaration, original security issued by the Pacific Island Forum leader in Nauru, as the moment of the Securitization Speech Act. In fact, the leaders reaffirmed that climate change remains the single greatest threat to the livelihoods, security, and well being of the peoples of the Pacific. Of course, the leaders say it's not the only. Uh, security threat that we have because our, the, the regional security environment is driven by multifaceted and secu uh, security challenges. But they acknowledge they have a collective, they have collective security interests. Then the 2019 Kainaki II Declaration for Urgent Climate Change Action now reiterated the urgency and the seriousness of climate change in the Pacific Islands region. So this photo is ideally one of the membership into the regional, the, the Pacific Island Climate Change Regional Security Complex. In other words, if you acknowledge that climate change is an existen ex existential threat to your nation and to the region, then you are a member of the club. Then, Two concepts that are often used interchangeably, but they are different. Climate change is a long-term change, both human and natural produced, in the average weather patterns of uh, our planet's local, regional, or global climates. Global warming is the long-term heating of the Earth climate system observed since the pre-industrial period when we start measuring, you know, the climate, the, the, the planet's temp, uh, temp, taking the planet's temperature. Uh, so the two common features are long term and observable. Then climate change is a non-traditional security issue. Uh, non-traditional security issues are of different nature, but they all arise primarily out of non-military sources and uh, they require comprehensive, which means integrated, holistic, political, economic and social responses. So all non-traditional security issues have some common characteristics. Uh, they are non-traditional in terms of origin, conception, and effects. And they cause 
societal and political instability, and uh, therefore they must be addressed uh, in an integrated fashion, in a multi-realm dimension, economy, society, politics. And yes, national solutions are often inadequate because they are, besides being non-traditional, they are very often also transnational. And D, transnational security issue, in my opinion, not E, but D, transnational security issue, is climate change. Why? For the simple fact that our planet is a system, a very complex system, synergistic, which means that it exists in a state of feedback. The, 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 the climate of our planet is a result of cycles. And also, climate destabilization is impacting every part of our planet, from thawing permafrost in the subarctic region to uh, rising sea level in the Pacific Islands region to uh, acidification of the ocean globally, et cetera, et cetera, won't linger. As former President of the Republic of Ireland, Mary Robinson, now President of the Climate Justice Foundation said, no country alone can protect its people from the impacts of climate change. So the problem here is that by virtue of their shared geographic characteristics and specificities, uh, the Pacific Island nations are facing an overlapping set of shared uh, vulnerabilities to the environmental, societal, political impacts of climate change. For some so-called atoll island nations, like Tuvalu or Marshall Islands, climate sea related sea level rise is a, an existential threat. They are at risk of partial or, God forbid, total inundation. Borrowing the words of the Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, Madam Jacinda Ardern, for the Pacific, climate change is not an hypothetical. It is real and it is happening now. The Pacific Islands, the Pacific Island nations are on the front line of climate change and are the first to be existentially impacted. Now the Defence Force of New Zealand drawn this logical chart of the, the dynamics and implications of climate change in terms of security from left, from right to left. Climate effects have environmental impacts that have social impacts that have security implications. And those security implications are often magnified by weak governance. So cooperation in the face of a, existing, of a non-traditional, transnational security issue or emergency is a must. So what are the areas in which cooperation should happen and is happening? Mitigation, adaptation, response to climate change, plus knowledge creation and dissemination in support of those initiatives. What is mitigation? Simply put, we should act to reduce greenhouse gases that cause uh, the climate change and exacerbate global warming. Adaptation. We need to make our societies resilient in the face of climate change impact. Responses, well, when adaptation and mitigation alone are not enough, we must respond. We must respond to 
climate change dis uh, cause disasters or emergencies. And then creation and dissemination of knowledge on climate change are work as enablers of mitigation, adaptations, and response. Again, you can see how adaptation and mitigation fit into alleviating the vicious circle of climate change. Ways ahead. Uh, the, the Pacific Island nations know very well that united, they are stronger. So interagency, cross-sectoral, regional and international collaborations are the way forward. In particular, the islands are acting to have a voice to maximize the influence uh, and, their, and, and their voice in the global arena. They are fighting against the, back, the media background nose of the media sphere. And then something we shouldn't hide is that global mitigation outcomes will depend primarily on the actions of large countries that are responsible for most carbon emissions. We wish to make some names without pointing the finger. The European Union, China, India, the United States. My point is not that those countries or a group of countries should be stigmatized. The point is that if they are indeed the root and part of the problem, they must be they must become also part of the solution. Then, combating climate change is a transgenerational endeavor. Uh, climate change has become a chronic problem and we must adopt a long-term transgenerational vision. Now, we are witnessing a extreme rhetoric on climate change that uh, as the sole outcome of uh, making political agreement on climate change and policy implementation more difficult while security deteriorates. Uh, I believe that we can avoid much of the political gridlock by implementing strategies that are science and technology enhanced and that they are both environment focus and human focus. The human factor is, is as much as important as the environmental factor. Uh, in other, speaking in a, well, strategic studies jargon, the strategy must have two centers of gravity, the environment and the people. And uh, well, I, I would like to read a short quote from Frank Herbert. The human question is not how many can possibly survive within the system. Humanity is not going to end because of climate change, but what kind of existence is possible for those who will do survive? Should we say that some people are condemned to destitution because of climate change, that they cannot improve, they will be in their conditions? Uh, should we say that we should go back to the Stone Age, I believe that the solution is in the opposite direction. Optimism, in other words, is an imperative here. Uh, humans are smart problem solvers. And if there is something we can learn from the Pacific Island nations is that we need to be also spiritually resilient. We are not just intelligent, we are also spiritually strong. It, it, sometimes it's just a matter of changing our outlook. As Richard Buckminster Fuller used to say, shifting from weaponry, killingry, to livingry. So the strategy that has been devised to address 
climate change, but also a, a complex uh, set of security issues, is the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific. As you can see, it is long term, it is ocean centric, and it's multi dimensional. And also, it has two foci the environment and the people. And those two elements are synergistically connected. Uh, we cannot address climate change if the people impacted by it are not resilient, are not prepared to do it, are not willing to fight, are not enabled to fight. Then every strategy needs an operational concept. And the operational concept ideally is that of a green-blue Pacific economies. Again, multi-stakeholder and uh, human-centric. And you can see all those logos. That's a visual message. The message is the Pacific, the, pe the nations of the Pacific, the people of the Pacific, need as many committed and generous partners as they can get. Well, I have the honor today of speaking in Tokyo, the capital of Japan. Japan is, uh, besides being a science and innovation powerhouse, is also a committed regional and global stakeholder, and Japan can help during the rest of this symposium, we'll hopefully find out why, uh, how and in which ways. So, ah, because I'm also, well, you know, I'm the sovereign holder of Malta's ambassador to Nauru. So I would like to invite you to join me in felicitating our friends of Nauru about their upcoming Independence Day. Thank you very much for your attention.